Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our session, Making Better, the Future of Manufacturing by 2030. I'm Vijay Vaitiswaran. I'm a senior editor at The Economist magazine and host of our brand new podcast on climate resilience called To a Lesser Degree. It's my great honor to be with you today to talk about this vital topic to the future of the global economy. That is the extraordinary transformation uh, that the manufacturing world is undergoing today. From fully circular production to biomanufacturing, the level of innovation achieved during the pandemic has started to take the world of manufacturing into a, an astonishing future. As new partnerships emerge to better society and the planet, what will that future of manufacturing look like by 2030? To help us figure this out, I'm delighted to say we have some expert uh, innovators at the forefront of the manufacturing world, as well as a senior government figure who will be joining us shortly. Let me first introduce my, my CEO leaders, uh, Rick Fuller, Chief Executive Officer and Co-Founder of Desktop Metal, joining us from the United States, and uh, Deepali Goenka, CEO and Joint Managing Director of Wellspun India, joining us from the subcontinent. Welcome to you both. Uh, I want to set the frame a little bit. We're going to ask for uh, the audience uh, to participate. There will be a poll using the Slido technology. Uh, you should all find this accessible on your uh, top link uh, screen. Please do participate. Uh, we will ask our guests to comment and pick up on the themes that you bring to us, as well as to pick up on your questions in the course of our conversation, uh, this panel. So uh, we appreciate your interactivity. Why don't we kick off uh, with some opening comments and provocations. Uh, Dipali, I'll start with you. Uh, how do you see manufacturing from where you sit and from the, the kinds of uh, technologies that are relevant in your industry, how do you see this advancing from the pandemic era we're in today? We hope we'll be in a post-pandemic era soon, uh, but nevertheless, uh, the, looking to the next 10 years, what do you see as one or two of the most important drivers of change from your point of view? You know, the whole thing, Vijay, that happened was digitization. The, I mean, you saw that in the e-commerce and hence, I mean, we saw that in, in, you know, in the whole manufacturing world as well. Uh, the whole uh, sense of sustainability, the whole consciousness about DEI and the other sustainability frame, frameworks also came into play. So when I talk about the 2030 kind of a manufacturing, it's all going to be AI, IoT and, and tech enabled because it's all going to be a digital world. So it's going to be about analytics and what triggers at the shelf triggers backwards from your manufacturing end. So the speed to market, the turnaround times faster, the blockchains, the connectivities are going to be the way forward. Now, uh, I have to push back a little bit, Dipali. Uh, you know, I, I, my last book that I wrote was on the future of innovation. I spent a lot of time with the Elon Musk's and Larry Pages of the world. Uh, this is the kind of thing that they like to talk about. Um, you are an industrialist. You're in the textiles industry. Uh, it seems uh, pretty far removed from all of these gee whiz kind of software things that a couple of guys in a garage are coming up with in, in Bangalore or in, uh, in uh, you know, Menlo Park. So... Help, help us understand what is the transformation that's going on from your very traditional historic industry to this kind of new digital future that you're telling us about. How is old meeting new and how, how easily uh, does the culture clash work there? I'll, give you, I'll just take two minutes of your time, Vijay. Imagine sure. farmer in the fields of cotton fields. He has an AI. He looks at it to see whether the soil is right where the rainfall that is going to be predicted is right for his crop. Then people like our factories, we have a blockchain. We have a QR code. We can trace back to the last bale of cotton from where the cotton is coming in from. Then at our factories, whether it is going to be spinning or weaving or processing or cut and sew, you have it on the platform. You can link and react. If there's kind of a maintenance issue where there's a kind of a machine failure, it all starts sparks up. If there's a failure of production, it all comes in real time. You're reacting to the speed very fast. And at the cut and sew, you have a QR code where you can actually trace back to the last bale of cotton from where the cotton has come in from. And then it is at the shelf space. You know, a consumer can get a product which can tell a story on its own. 
imagine that. And then when you're selling it on e-commerce, you can really have a predictive analytics to Google or the other things and see that how you can, what, what is the demand that the consumer is looking at? Whether, you know, that basket size or the ticket size of the product that she's going to buy will have your product by the end of the day. So Dipali, I, I love this um, uh, vision of visibility and transparency across the value chain. Um, how much of this is what you're already doing now versus how much of it is the 2030 vision that I asked you about? Uh, give us a sense of what's real versus how much more work we need to do to make the technology practical, to make it affordable, uh, to make sure that it's not adopted only by the 1% of top companies like yours, but across the industry. You know, Vijay, we are doing most of it right now because it's a vision, because it's the next two to three. COVID just changed everything for us. For me, WellTrack, where I can trace it back to the last wheel of cotton, started three years back from 2016. Now I am working on blockchain, where I'll be working with my vendor communities um, so I can trace back and have a complete transparent world where, you know, it the vendors and the manufacturers coexist together. So that's already on the move. And I think fundamentally, Vijay, for me, and I think um, I would uh, ask Rick also to step in, is that, you know, when you talk about technology, it's not about just technology, it's a culture change. For me, in, I'm upskilling my management teams to the new era of digitization. I have Great. people who have formatted their own programs because I've trained them to do that. I mean, there's kind of these training facilities that I've already had. And my blue-collar blue associates, you know, textiles. You know, everybody has this vision of these blue-collar associates. But, you know, imagine they'll be working on it. They'll be trained on Industry 4.0. So we'll, we'll come back to the workforce question in, in a moment, but but you're absolutely right. It's it's fascinating um, uh, part of this question. Rick, we've heard from uh, Dipali, who has a global audience, uh, a global set of customers, uh, in a sense, as part of a global supply chain. It was it was ever thus in her industry. But we've also seen a radical change in how supply chains are managed, where companies source, how they make. Can you help us understand how the... Uh, dramatic advances in additive manufacturing might lead to a future manufacturing that would be hyper-localized, that uh, we might very well see uh, production cited closer to customers, allowing for rapid innovation loops and, and, and faster response cycles, maybe even more resilient kinds of supply chains as a result. Can you give us your vision of the future and where are you in that journey to 2030? Absolutely, Vijay. I mean, I think added manufacturing has been a technology that's been in development for a significant amount of time. And the industry today is probably 15 times the size that it was uh, at the end of the, uh, you know, sort of the, the 2000s decade. And uh, a lot of the growth has been in end use part production. So adapting a technology that initially was used for printing tooling to now actually produce the actual end use part. Uh, when you go into this journey, you really change the economics of the products and, and the global trade uh, dynamics of a product. After the previous industrial revolution, we had set up locations with economies of scale and people started shipping goods all over the world that led to tariffs and our current economic sure. sure. In our current, uh, it, with this new technology, you could produce locally with the same efficiency that you would have produced uh, products uh, in other parts of the world, and you could mass customize and you could modify your designs and hyper localize them like you're like you're suggesting, and uh, you end up with a borderless production world. Uh, I think uh, the ability to to qualify a product and know that you can now make it in any of your sixty plants. Uh, if you're a large company and let's say you have sixty plants, traditionally right. each plant is a different type of product. Now with this type of capability. Any plant can produce any product. You can have inventory of one. You don't have to have spare parts uh, stored in a warehouse for for a decade just because you did a production run uh, when when something was was involving production. So, well, Rick, it, uh, let, let me stop you there. You, you've laid out the vision and given us a sense of where we could go. We'll, we'll come back to this in a moment, but we're very fortunate to have our um, uh, distinguished visitor here joining us uh, just now. So let, let's take advantage of that. Uh, His Excellency, well, Mr. Mustafa Varak. Uh, Mr. Minister, thank you for joining us. We're uh, thank very you, much thank looking you. forward, forward to your comments. For, thank you so much. Sorry for interrupting, but we are no, 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 on the contrary, programs, we, we, programs we eagerly await 
Not to worry, sir. We're, we're eager to hear your words of wisdom. Okay. Uh, I will turn the microphone over to you. Please uh, give us your thoughts on thank what you. you think is important on the digital transformation for manufacturing. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, distinguished participants. It's a great pleasure for me to address you at the Sustainable Development Impact Summit. I would like to take this opportunity to extend my warmest greetings to all of you from Turkey. The World Economic Forum creates its distinctive atmosphere by bringing all parties together to discuss critical global challenges. Thanks to this summit, we can discuss novel actions needed to build an equitable, inclusive, and sustainable global recovery from the pandemic. While we are all seeking a way out from the pandemic, we witness the importance of emerging technologies, transforming the production, enabling more efficient processes, and creating new value for industry, society, and of course, for the environment. We need coordinated and comprehensive plans to ensure inclusive digital transformation, which will spread evenly across and within industries and societies. In this regard, we launched our industry and technology strategy to encourage companies to drive inclusive, responsible, and sustainable digital transformation. Although manufacturing accounts for about 22% of global employment, the majority of manufacturers still lack a clear strategy on how best to equip their uh, workforce. Hereby, we participate in WEF's Closing the Skills Gap Accelerators Program for the upskilling and recycling of the workforce. We also actively participate in worldwide initiatives on creating necessary regulations and ethical uh, norms governing AI development. Based on the human-centric AI principles set by WEF, G20, OECD, UNESCO, and EU, we designed our national AI strategy. In particular, we will focus on improving the human capital and how to increase their employment while supporting research, entrepreneurship, and innovation. Distinguished participants, along with the pandemic, the international supply chain system is experiencing a disruption arising from emerging technologies, growing economic nationalism, and sustainability problems. Turkish manufacturers have shown a successful performance in fulfilling their domestic and international commitments in this period. We have also witnessed very positive developments in our startup ecosystem. Turkish startups received nearly 1.3 billion US dollars of investment in the first half of the year. Today, many multinationals such as Ford, Toyota, Samsung, Nestle, GE, Huawei prefer Turkey as an R&D and manufacturing hub in the region. We have further reinforced this competitive position with the reform process conducted uninterruptedly for the last two decades. As a result, Turkey jumped 10 places and ranked uh, 41st in this year's Global Innovation Index. We continuously simplify and update our regulatory framework and incentive programs in line with the changing needs, needs and global trends. For instance, we are designing a new incentive package to support transformation of the sectors for their compliance with the European Green Deal. We have started a project with the name Opportunities in Global Supply Chains for the Turkish manufacturing industry after COVID-19. Uh, this is the project which aims to assess the opportunities in global supply chains and to define concrete steps for technological transformation and upgrading of Turkish industries. We are also living in a more complicated and fast-changing world with interconnected problems and challenges. Businesses, governments, and civil societies are undertaking initiatives to define these problems, search for solutions, and take actions. International cooperation is the key to reap the benefits of digital transformation.
In this regard, we joined WEF Center for Fourth Industrial Revolution Network to harness and to disseminate the technologies for the future. Next, the world's, uh, I think, the large, largest digital transformation and capacity building center supports our industry and workforce with tailored and comprehensive programs with more than to 130 use cases. As you well know, companies face some challenges during the digital transformation. In this regard, we have launched the Smart Industry Readiness Index, which is one of the most effective digital maturity assessment programs on a global scale. Regardless of a scale or industry, we provide production-oriented methodology instead of generic digital transformation applications. Applicable roadmap and per personalized consultancy instead of superficial suggestions. Comparative sectoral per performance with the world's largest company pool instead of just individual performances. We also work in partnership with the platforms in the WEF, like Shaping the Future of Advanced Manufacturing and Value Chains platform and Global Lighthouse Network. These platforms enable our companies to obtain first-hand perspectives from advanced manufacturers. Distinguished guests, Another important issue is sustainability. Countries are unable to align their supplier base and business environment with sustainable development goals face the risk of being out of the game. A rising number of multinational companies have already worked only with suppliers that adhere to their social and environmental standards. We are conducting studies to boost the compliance of the business climate and the regulatory framework with uh, sustainable development goals and European Green Deal. The European Green Deal, in particular, a carbon border adjustment mechanism, will have an enormous impact on uh, global value chains in many sectors. To eliminate possible negative effects of the deal and to turn the obligations into opportunities, we prepared a national Green Deal action plan. With this action plan, our industry will sustain a stronger position in the global value chains, by, both by protecting their economic integration with the EU and by providing lower carbon content products. Recently, we have also prepared the Sustainable Development Goals Investor Map in partnership with United Nations Development Program, UNDP. The inclusiveness and sustainability of investments are as important as the magnitude of the investments. The map will enable to mobilize sustainable development goal-oriented investments and accelerate SDG progress in Turkey. Dear participants, I know I, I talk a lot, but uh, I am coming uh, the end of my talk. Uh, the last point is ensuring the world rebounds stronger from the pandemic will only be possible if we revitalize economies with new tools and policies needed global cooperation. We will continue to work together with all partners to achieve the scale and create good practices that will set an example for the world. Let me conclude my words by thanking all of you for your participation and leave the floor uh, to distinguished participants uh, and distinguished panelists for sharing their valuable experiences. Thank you so much and take care. Thank you, Minister. We appreciate your uh, intervention. Very good. Uh, so, Rick uh, Dipali, we heard some uh, powerful words uh, from the minister on how Turkey is preparing for a changing world, a rapidly changing world. Um, I want to hear what our participants have said from the audience. Uh, why don't we take this opportunity to put up the results of uh, the Slido poll? I think we have a word cloud that could be giving us a bit of an impression of the audience. Oh, good heavens. Okay, there we go. Um, the elephant in the room is clearly innovation. Hopefully we'll ride that elephant successfully. Uh, and almost everything else is of comparable size. 
So, uh, Rick, let me turn to you first this time. Um, there we go. Okay, now we're, we're seeing uh, slight changes as we go along. Can you comment on what you're seeing and uh, give us a sense of how we link it back to some of the themes of the day? Absolutely. I mean, look, uh, one of the really great things about about this new technologies to manufacture products like additive manufacturing and you know processes that are toolless uh, is that they uh, have a lot less waste that's associated with making the products. You don't have to ship them all over the world and increase your CO2 footprint when you do that. You can produce them locally and you can customize them to the markets that those products uh, are going to be uh, targeted towards. So, uh, you know, it, it has definitely significant implications for, for global growth and uh, the ability for people to uh, be able to uh, really democratize the, the capabilities of, of producing products are, uh, you know, th th there's a, a movement uh, as we get polymers and metal products uh, able to produce through this kind of technology on the textile space. There's companies like Cornet that enable very rapid on-demand textile production. Uh, companies like Amazon are adopting that at scale. I think Amazon went from 10 to 150 to 450 to build over a billion dollars in textile production this year, fully on demand with no factories. Uh, uh, and well, there's a factory, but the factory can print anything digitally based on what's needed. So, uh, th this move of, uh, of uh, digitizing the production definitely has significant environmental and, and sustainability benefits. Dipali, do you want to weigh in on what we're hearing from our audience? Yeah, interesting. I mean, innovation, sustainable, and collaboration, I think those are the key things that uh, I saw. Um, innovation will be the road uh, ahead for everybody. And uh, I think that, and sustainability, they, they go hand in hand. I think I'll give you a little glimpse into what we do. Um, we, uh, we start a story from a scrapyard, from the plastic or the rags that are generated in the factory at the scrapyard. The rags get broken up into fiber and then spun into yarn and get back into the fabric. The plastic gets you know, broken up into a chip again and comes back into the packaging. So I think the important aspect is how sustainable and how, you know, when we talk about farm to, we used to talk about farm to shelves. Now we have to talk about farm to cradle. So, uh, you know, the world's been talking about the landfills. You know, and I think that's where we need to go back to. So the last mile. So, you know, we used to have a RF, a RFID chip in a product. So imagine if you can trace it back to the last consumer usage and traces it back to how it is used back into manufacturing so that it comes back into, uh, you know, the fold. I think Vijay, that's where the world is moving towards. So, I, you know, sustainability will be ruling the roost. I mean, um, so why... Let me, let, me, let, me, let me press on this. Um, you, you raised the, the sort of a vision... Uh, that a lot of uh, climate activists want to see that is a, a world of circular economy, right? Yeah. This is quite the buzzword. Uh, now, I, I can remember uh, 20 years ago uh, at Davos in Switzerland, uh, maybe 10 years ago at summer Davos in China, moderating sessions on the circular economy and what a great idea it would be. And everyone was very much cheerleading. Uh, we haven't seen a whole lot of progress. The latest figures they see is something like maybe 8% of the world's manufacturing could be reasonably considered to be circular. Um, uh, if it were really to take off in earnest, uh, one way or the other, through mandates or industry practice or technology enablement or consumer pressure, wouldn't that actually be bad for your business? Doesn't your industry depend on people loving fashion and clothes and wanting to buy more? Uh, how do you square this with your own uh, requirements to deliver returns to your shareholders, to your own financial uh, fiduciary duties? You know, Vijay, one aspect you spoke about could be about slow fashion, but I'm talking about, you spoke about circularity. Circularity is about going the full circle where your product is broken back and coming back into creating a new product. And it is, it is something that we can really add a lot of value, e even in, 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 you know, to the extent of supply chain, the extent of fashion, um, and also appealing to the millennials and the Gen Z. Um, and uh, I think that's becoming trend. And I think for us, uh, it's a part of our innovation and that's what we do. Uh, so it doesn't- uh, Can, can it doesn't... you give an example? Is there something you can point to as a concrete example? Yeah, I can. Um, uh, so uh, we have these rags. I'll give you two examples. Uh, so uh, one is about the rags that are generated out of a sheets. 
they find a way out where we pick up, we, we take these rags and uh, we have communities around the factories. There are these community centers where women, they are very articulate in the terms of what they do in craftsmanship. So they weave beautiful rugs and cushions out of it. And it is sold as beautiful products globally. What it does is that there's circularity, you're upcycling that much of rags, you're also giving livelihoods to those many people so the children go to school. So that's one aspect of one impact that you're doing. The other aspect is that when you have these rags that are generating, that are generated out of your factory, you break them up. You break them up into fabric, uh, fabric into fiber, fiber, and, and spin it into yarn and use it back into your product, into your virgin products. So 30% of it, if it mixes back, I think that can create a far more sustainable uh, supply chain for us. Another thing is, Vijay, at, at Wellspun, at our factories, we mm -hmm. use 30, we actually use 30 million liters of water. You know, tex textile is water guzzler. And sure. we, we don't even use a drop of, you know, uh, fresh water. You know, and that water is used for the farmers, for irrigation, and for the communities for portable drinking water. So I think, you know, that's where there's a lot of impact that happens. The biofuel, there's a sludge that is generated out of a processing machines, is used as a biofuel, and that is used in a canteens for a people at the factory. So it is interesting. I mean, it's, it's about, you know, there's a whole lot of things that can be added on to the value chain. I could see that. And, and you've been able to do this augmenting your business uh, model, as it were. Uh, although it's in some cases, I think, it, to be fair, it, the people will have to find new business models in some industries. Uh, we're getting some questions in from the audience. Let, let me turn to those, um, as I had promised. Um, uh, and maybe, Ian, you can take a stab at this first, although I welcome comments from both of you. Uh, how do you create circularity in value chains that are not vertically integrated? Where is collaboration required? Will everyone benefit? So in a sense, this is, uh, I guess, an ecosystems question. Rick, how do you think about this? Yeah, I mean, we have a product that's circular that that uh, allows you to print wood. Uh, and we we basically use the reverse of the process to make paper. When you, when you look at wood, it's made of cellulose and lignin. And when you make paper, you split the lignin from the cellulose, and then you take the cellulose converted to pulp. Uh, here, we have a process where we use sawdust as the starting point. Uh, and then inkjet lignin to reform wood, and then you can decorate it and make it virtual, like, like, and make it look like any uh, piece of wood or, or class of wood, and make furniture out of it. And you're essentially using waste, upscaling it, uh, or, so that you could uh, make end-use products that prevents you from, you know, taking trees down. And and uh, again, you've got a uh, the ability to, to to do great things when you look at at uh, reusing the the waste streams and then uh, you have to start to make a circular product you have to start from scratch and then think about uh, how can you reimagine the production process uh, to to end up with something that that can really be cradle to cradle uh, it, it uh, it's harder when you've got an investment in factories and people that are trained and they do it one one way but you can start component by component uh, in that in that network uh, and then find uses for all the all the scrap materials to be able to reuse them and, and minimize waste so so Rick we have a question uh, for you on whether these sorts of technologies are applicable across all industries for example could you make textiles and either sell your machines to Dipali or or start a company <laughs> to compete compete against her so we we are we are in elastomers wood metal and and polymers it, we we make the world's fastest mass production systems uh, in those segments there is a company called Cornet that does 3d printers for textiles and uh, you know you can buy products on Amazon that you know, there was no inventory after the purchase is made the product is created so you don't actually have to like send it all over the world they they make it right but after you click buy and it's on demand and you get it a, a two days later. So well, Deepali, that, what do you think about this? Uh, is this something that's going to augment your business or, or disrupt? You know, uh, Rick, Rick has a point. And I think a couple of things when you talk about a 3d and a digital printing, we would use it for products, which are far more, uh, you know, expensive where there's a value. So when I talk about a $4 towel or a $3 towel or a $20, $30 sheet, 
It doesn't work. That's where the value, that's where, and that's your sweet price point, right? So for a value like, you know, a, you know, a rug that is sold for maybe $99, $100 could be made on shore. And that can be a real, you know, just in time. So I think it's all about the value, but we are going to be moving towards digital printing. And I think the world is moving towards that, but it will be the products that can be really of real value which really could be something that the consumer is, you know, ha having a uh, kind of, here you're, you're, you know, you are, you are actually manufacturing like hundreds and hundreds and thousands of meters and meters of fabric, which you can't do in digital printing at all. Sure. Now we have a, a, a tough skeptical question from um, one of our audience members asking, how do you really decide which technologies to invest in? Uh, is sustainability impact truly a real factor in deciding? And you know, just to amplify this, you know, I, I had looked at the question of automation in factories during the pandemic, and um, the data show that there was a significant increase in the pace of automation in factories around the world um, during the pandemic. But a lot of it had to do with, for example, um, labor shortages, uh, people wanting to perhaps uh, introduce uh, pandemic safety, right, uh, because of the COVID restrictions and try to avoid COVID-related shutdowns. If you have an automated factory or mostly automated factory, you can keep running more likely than if you have thousands of people coming in and out every day as in the old days. Uh, and so uh, CapEx spending that might have been delayed was spent during the uh, pandemic or automation that was in the pipeline was advanced. That's really nothing to do with sustainability per se. So with, with that in mind, uh, what, how do you, both of you answer the skeptic that says these sorts of decisions are made not really based on sustainability, but on other factors? Um, Rick, why you want to take that up? Then I'll follow you. It's a, it's a combination. I mean, like, uh, um, I mean, the world's highest end materials are, are uh, including our printed, like uh, a scarf, all the scarves from Hermes are, are printed on Reggiani printers mm -hmm. and, and uh, mm -hmm. or EFI machines. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The on the world of um, how do you accelerate? And we, all, I, all I can tell you is we've seen incredible acceleration in demand for these classes of products and the ability to have flexibility uh, since the pandemic started. And I think it's going to be a huge acceleration, just like you saw the the Roaring Twenties after the the uh, Spanish flu. I think we're going to see a decade of innovation in uh, production technology because of the supply chain constraints, you know, that, that we've had now people in, in the, in a, you know, we've had, just look at the spot price of containers uh, coming from Asia to the States, their 10 X increase in, 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 a, in the price point, which basically is going to drive the world towards a distributed production model. Uh, we could try to say many things, but it, it's just the, the, the way it's going. So I think companies that are in the business today, they're probably going to leverage their customer base and invest in technology and build capabilities closer to their customers and, and be able to provide a more mass customized uh, world. Uh, but Rick, uh, uh, you know, the, it's, it's clear you're, you're a believer in the digitization of manufacturing. Uh, uh, that's a, an ongoing trend, well documented. But another question comes in from a different participant that's also a little bit skeptical. It says, look, you know, if it's really true that digitization of manufacturing is sustainable, question um, mark, uh, you know, how do you uh, move in further in that direction? And that raises the question, uh, isn't uh, aren't these wonderful tools of advanced manufacturing that we've discussed and uh, that you, you both have advocated, isn't it true that they're like any multipurpose technology, uh, like artificial intelligence? It can be used for good or it can be used for evil. And, and so in that sense, um, they're not particularly sustainable or resource sparing in and of themselves. And you could have loads and loads of local manufacturing, but if we all become hyper consumers and buy 10 times as much because things are readily available, then we will end up not circular, not sustainable, simply in a in a, a worse place on sustainability, that is, it's uh, it's agnostic. It's sustainability agnostic. Is it possible that that's true, or do you disagree with that premise? I think that's really where the first question was coming from. Uh, is is the argument that digitization is in fact more sustainable than the traditional asset heavy, uh, sorry, uh, labor heavy way of doing things? The traditional way of doing things. Maybe Deepali, you want to jump in there. Uh, you know, digitization is going to be the way forward and it is going to be sustainable. And I think uh, there was a thing about collaboration. So when you talk about technology and I mean, uh, you know, when you, you have to integrate your vendor base, you, and you have your ancillarization just a couple of kilometers away and that's what Wellspin has. And if you're integrating them through technology, you're also collaborating, you're looking at your carbon footprints, you're also looking at just-in-time kind of an inventory. 
your turnaround becomes faster. So Vijay, I think everything will work hand in hand. I think for manufacturing where, you know, the costs are getting prohibitive, there are a lot of other challenges. And I, I think for, uh, for a world where, where there are, there's dynamism, there's challenges uh, in the terms of fuel, everything. I mean, you're seeing what uh, containers, uh, you, know, uh, you know, there's, a, you know, kind of a chaos that's happening. You will have to have technology. I mean, we are looking at tracking our containers uh, by, uh, uh, by, a, by a thing called device called Shipsy, which can tell you where it is coming in and where it is. I mean, you, you will have to do everything. You will have to have blockchains so that you can integrate the whole supply chain together. And um, I know Rick spoke about onshoring, but I think it's going to be a kind of um, a reactive kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it's going to be a completely strategic way of looking at how the world will work. For me, I will have my warehouses in the United States of America where I do a D2C kind of delivery to my customers. I might have just-in-time kind of inventory that will be there in America or in UK or in Europe, if I have to say. But my mega base could be in manufacturing in India because here I employ around 15,000 people. It's kind of, that's kind of an employing, uh, employment generation. But looking at how we can look at you know, growing, growing cotton sustainably, uh, you know, looking at farmers, their whole supply chain. I think there's a whole lot of things, Vijay, that goes beyond. And I think digitization is going to work hand in hand, collaboratively with, uh, with the world that we're talking about. Let me ask a different question. This picks up one, one of the comments the minister made uh, in his intervention, and that is uh, the role of national policy. Um, we're seeing that in the, uh, we're increasingly seeing a borders up kind of world. It's not the era of unfettered globalization that we lived through uh, for a few decades, uh, the era of cheap China and sort of a, uh, open borders. We've seen not only the tariff wars under Trump, but more generally now nationalism in economic policy. We see it in Europe, in parts of Asia, under President Biden, there are bi-local kind of initiatives with uh, different parts of uh, his economic policies. How much do you think about or worry or take pleasure in, if it's going to help your business model, uh, the idea that countries may source more locally in part because of uh, economic nationalism and government policy? Uh, Rick, is this something that could actually help your business model? Because, again, you're uh, empowering local manufacturing. I mean, we we are totally agnostic to to this part of the model. Our products are used in everything from consumer electronics to automotive, and uh, sometimes the the capital investment that already exists in in the rest of the production uh, uh, chain dictates that the equipment is put uh, in different parts of the world. And and uh, we we're in sixty five countries today, so it is a. Uh, uh, we're, we live in a global world. Nothing's going to sort of uh, move that backwards. Uh, I do see a huge opportunity to then, over time, digitize plants and make them uh, more distributed. Like, but but the reality is we have a really long arc. I think there's a, uh, you know, in this decade, our, our particular industry is going from $12 billion at the end of 2019 to $150 billion by the end of this decade, depending on which analyst you, you talk to. Uh, but it is a... a um, a long arc because we have $12 trillion worth of goods that are made every year and there's installed capacity for that 12 trillion. So it's a little bit like the, the digitization of transportation with electric vehicles. Uh, it takes a long time to turn over the fleet because the, the product lasts 12 years on the road. And so right. you, you have a legacy oh. assets question, but it sounds yeah, like so if you're in dozens of countries, you're well hedged that economic we're policy. We're in 55 countries and, and uh, right. we, you know, there's definitely some protectionism. I think it's unfortunate because it hampers economic growth and uh, globally. But but uh, uh, we, wh what I th think is really exciting is is the fact that this technology is 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 going to enable people to do more things in more places. Dipali, how do you uh, think about that question? And, and we're running out of time, so if you could even yeah. turn it around to say, what would you like to see? that would be helpful to the future of manufacturing from governments. I'll give both of you a minute to answer that. What, what's a helpful policy or what support would you like to see? No, but I think, uh, Vijay, one thing uh, is that, you know, um, I don't, uh, I, I will uh, go by what Rick said. Uh, we are looking at a world that's agnostic and technology and e-commerce has, has shown us that. I think it's going to be one place and, and technology is enable, going to enable you to do that. 
Um, for us in India, India government has, is promoting exports. Government is opening up the borders. Uh, I think, and the world will open up also. There will be a few a few countries with protectionism, but I think overall we are looking at a world that, which is going to be united by e-commerce and digitization, and it, it's going to be the way forward, Vijay. Okay, uh, so supporting openness is is what you'd like to see from government, Rick. A last word from you. Yeah, likewise, I think less regulation and easier to do business globally, yeah. easier to yeah. get your products uh, to the right places uh, on on demand is is really the future. Great. You know, mm -hmm. no, no great shock here. Business leaders support, you know, less intervention and less regulation from government and more open borders. But I think uh, as a, uh, you know, editor at The Economist, which was founded 185 years ago to defend free trade, and argue for the benefits uh, of openness, I certainly am, am with you on this one. Uh, we know historically periods of economic nationalism and protectionism have led to less consumer welfare, to industrial harm, to lower levels of innovation. Um, and so we, we hope that um, uh, the period, the future will, will not prove to be one of deglobalization, but one of, at the moment we're in what we call globalization. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but we hope we can return to a period of more openness and interconnectivity. So on that optimistic note, let me draw our session to a close. Uh, I want to thank my wonderful panelists. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and, and for um, uh, giving us some hard truths from the front lines where you are, as well as to our minister who joined us with his intervention. We thank him as well. And uh, I ask my audience, uh, we appreciate your many comments. It really uh, means a lot to us that you are interactive and engaged. Uh, please continue to share your reflections on social media channels as well as on TopLink. And you can find further programming on the TopLink platform as well. Thank you all very much and goodbye. <laughs>